like to take you to uh, a new aspect that is called microbiome. Um, basically, we started our work on intracellular uh, carcinoma, and uh, major concern was the survival rate, which is uh, going to be very lower in the hepatocellular carcinoma. In our initial studies, uh, what we found was that whenever the liver cancer is getting used, chemically we are using two categories. One is called the DNA damage, second is the, the ROS. This was not the concern. It increases the oxidative stress. Once the oxidative stress was there, then uh, through the inflammatory pathogens, the NF propagate, the NF particular data. Tissue damage is uh, seen. Once the oxidative stress is there, automatically the prototypic and anti oxidative pathways are also which uh, activate the, uh, the matrix metal of protein that will be 2 and 9. And then the liver cancer is getting uh, activated. So uh, we were working on I think, uh, targeting these three mechanisms. Automatically, uh, we have been not hearing a lot about uh, the possible targets for the uh, cancer treatment. We have got around 7 to 8 uh, different targets. And most commonly, everybody is uh, working on the chemotherapy cases. I would not say it is a, uh, one of the best targets and easiest target which is going to be there. Mode of actions are uh, clear, either you are going to have a DNA damage or you are going to be uh, using the apoptosis or you are going to have nuclear type of therapy. One of the uh, side effects which is going to be seen are the normal cells are also going to be affected or not. As uh, we have n number of chemotherapy patients available, we have uh, been used uh, five uh, fluorouracil and uh, doxorubicin as the standard chemotherapy agents because they have a few different mode of action. We were uh, interested on the gut microbiome, not from the cancer point of view, from the diabetic point of view, but because uh, they, they have seen that once the individual is going to be in a pre-diabetic state, the whole flora starts changing. This is the uh, uh, the composition of which is going to be there in the human as it changes from the newborn to the toddler to the adult to the uh, elderly individuals, the whole flora is going to be uh, different. You are basically going to have three major things. There is a fermentulous, bacteroids and proteobacteria. Fermentulous are supposed to be the gram positive. Bacteroids and proteobacteria are supposed to be the gram negative. So you are going to have a balance between these three. And uh, the formicules are supposed to be the beneficial ones and the proteo and the bipedo are going to be the lesser uh, beneficial ones, the gram-negative mechanism. Whenever you are talking about the whole flora, you are going to have the GA tract. And in this GA tract, you have got a different physiological condition starting from the stomach till the anal region, where the stomach has got very highly acidic conditions. So the so the flora which is going to be there in the GA in the stomach is going to be in tennis power 1 and it starts increasing from the colon, uh, the small intestine part where the duodenum and jujulum have a very uh, less amount of flora because the pH is around 6, uh, around 5.5 to 6 and then it starts increasing, it starts increasing from the idiom part. When you talk about the, uh, the large intestine where you are going to have the maximum flora available, so this is where the maximum interaction is going to take place, where you are going to have a competition for the nutrients, Addi uh, addition sites are going to be there, you are going to have direct antagonism coming up with respect to the pathogenic uh, flora, and then you are going to have immune modulation through the M cells and the uh, antigen pregnant cells and all the uh, immunological systems are coming. Now, in a separate study, what we found out that whenever you are talking about modulation of this gut flora, the GA tract functions are altered, but surprisingly, what we found out that even the liver functions are getting altered and it starts with a low grade inflammation because in uh, the microflora, you are going to have a gram positive and gram negative. Gram negative has the lipopolysaccharide. Now, uh, lipopolysaccharide are endotoxins in nature. They are going to be binding to the toddler receptors. We have got multiple, around 13 different types of toilet receptors and predominantly for the blood flora you have, you have TLR2 and TLR4. TLR2 binds to the gram positive and TLR4 binds to gram negative lipopolysaccharide. 
Now, whenever there is a uh, drug modulation, the gram negative for operation decreases, so automatically the lipopolysaccharide level starts increasing. They bind to the TLR code. Once they bind to the TLR codes, now these TLR codes are going to be activating two separate pathways, specifically in the liver, wherein they activate NF copabi. Once the NF copabi gets activated, this is the given as a condition which is similar to that in the liver cancer where in uh, NF copabi after the TNF alpha tissue theta and the tissue damage. And on the other hand, you are going to have a complete immune modulation through the T-like and the assembling pathway. And they are uh, ensuring that the liver uh, immune dysfunction is taking place. This immune dysfunction aggravates the uh, tissue damage and then liver inflammation is going to be upregulated. Now, what we uh, thought was we have we can we have been inducing liver cancer. We wanted to study the role of the chemotherapeutic agents. Whether these chemotherapeutic agents are in a way causing the blood microbiome modulation or not, that was not known to us. But we have seen that the role of these chemotherapeutic agents as a good anti-cancer therapy that is also reported and our results were confirming the uh, all the mechanism. So we studied three other uh, mechanisms, doxorubicin, pyrofibrosin and the combination of dox and uh, pyrofibrosin. And we found out that doxorubicin was giving us the best results whether we talk about the tissue recovery, whether we talk about uh, inflammatory cytokines. When we talk about these inflammatory cytokines, we are uh, mainly concerned about the NF copper because whenever we are talking about the stored like receptors, TLR2 and TLR4, both are going to be targeting the NF copper but when TLR4s are going to be upregulated, that is through the uh, LPS pathway, you are going to have the pro-inflammatory cytokine aggravated. Now, on one hand, we have seen that the TLRs, uh, uh, the NF copper is activated. Whether the TLRs are going to be upregulated in the cancer or not, after the chemotherapy agent uh, uh, administration or not, we found out that the TLR2, that is for the gram positive, uh, and TLR4 for the gram negative. Now, this is the dog speaker, and this is uh, in the previous uh, cancer, dog speaker, and combination. Now, dog speaker is giving me more uh, levels of TLR4. Uh, same with the core case with the LPS, that is the serum LPS is high. NLRs are again going to be for the gram negative and NLR, NLR1 is for gram negative, NLR2 is for gram positive. So we have seen that the gram negative population is uh, upregulated through the LPS also automatically. Is the phyla going to be changed or not? Now when we found out that so, Formicules, Bacteroids and Protobacteria, three main groups, Formicules are the gram positive, uh, Bacteroids and Protobacteria are gram negative, L they are the source of the LPS, now it is a significant upregulation from the uh, cancer group. So that means, even if you are giving uh, the chemotherapeutic agents, they are in a way aggravating the inflammation, that is the small low grade inflammation. Same is the case with the genera where the lactobacillin and bifidol are supposed to be the gram positive, beneficial strain, and then you are going to have the clostridium and E. coli which are supposed to be the, uh, the gram negative uh, markers. Now they are uh, upregulated. Can the gut flora modulation benefit the patients or not? Now from the previous studies we have seen that doxorubicin is the most uh, beneficial chemotherapy agent. So we thought of continuing the doxorubicin. Along with that, we started giving the gut uh, flora modulator, which we have designed for our diabetic uh, studies. And then, if we withdraw this one after eight weeks of treatment, because everybody, uh, we are till now, whatever uh, reports are there, till that time we are giving the treatment, results are good. The moment you are saying that results have been reversed to the control group, the study is over. Now, if we continue the animal, for another two weeks without any treatment, dox treatment or the dox plus the modulator, is there any change in the system? To our surprise, once you are giving the dox treatment for eight weeks and withdrawing it after a complete reversal, there is the reversal of in the pre-cancer stages. This was also seen in most of the cytokine uh, studies where in the uh, 2 and 2 and 2 and 2 and 
enough capability in a particular teacher data. All the parameters are reverting the system in a dog withdrawal system to back to the pre cancer stages. But when we are giving the dogs plus the gutturum modulator and even withdrawing that, that is somehow preventing the reversal characteristics. Now, this was our diabetic studies where we have seen the interferons, the MNP2, IRP, they are all going to be upregulated. Similar results are also seen when we are withdrawing them. Even the LPS levels are higher. This is the dogs treated. This is the DOCS plus withdrawal. Now, the DOCS plus withdrawal is increasing the characteristics similar to the pre-cancer stages. Say in the case the PLR4, PLR4 shows a very high level of upregulation as compared to uh, the DOCS trigger. So, if you are giving DOCS alone or DOCS uh, withdrawal, you are going to have almost clear character, similar characteristics. But with DOCS plus the Gutflora moderator, and even withdrawal, withdrawal is going to be benefiting if the uh, gut flora is altered. Similarly, uh, with respect to the general phylas also, solid use, that device. This is the gram of positive which is getting affected by even after the dog treatment. And this is uh, the, uh, where the bacteroids and the proteobacteria are going to be there. The problem is not uh, like uh, Dr. Ramin has told that uh, alternative medicine. Now, here we are trying to complement the uh, gut flora modulation, wherein you have a chemotherapy agent, which is the best chemotherapy agent available for any, at least for the animal experimentation point of view, because I'm a clinician, I cannot tell about the, the, the clinical uh, aspect of that. With respect to animal experimentation, we have seen doxorubicin are supposed to be the best anti uh, cancer or chemotherapy agent available for experimentation. If you are supplementing the anti cancer therapy or any cancer therapies along with the gut flora, the systems are going to be beneficial. Because whenever we are talking about the gut flora, and uh, even in our uh, diabetic uh, studies, we have, what we have seen that gut floras are going to be highly modulated as soon as any change is going to be there in the diet, whether you are talking about uh, change uh, from the normal diet to the high sugar diet or high fat diet, any diet or high fiber, fiber diet also you take, the gut flora is significantly modulated. And this modulation is not temporary. One time uh, administration can modulate the system for at least two to three weeks. Now this two to three weeks may depend upon the intensity of the food, the quantity of the food taken and the level of the constituent which is modulating the flora. Automatically, whenever any of the therapeutic modulations are there, we are talking about treating the cancer. Whenever we are talking about treatment of the cancer, we are only talking about the tissue in picture. Now, right now we are working on the liver cancer, so our intention is to modulate the cancerous characteristics in the liver. But what about the blood axis? Because Dr. Leon uh, told uh, talked about the gut brain axis. Now, when you say that uh, the gut brain axis, you are talking about the enteric plexus where the, the GA tract is modulating the brain functioning. Automatically, the anxiety, the food, uh, the craving for the food, everything is modulated through the gut. So, if there is a dysbiosis in the gut, even if you are taking care of the cancerous uh, characteristics, things are not going to be effective. So, uh, take home uh, message what I will be uh, suggesting is, you are going to have a gut flora which is going to be a master regulator now because gut flora has been reported to be one of the main mechanisms through this even the autism can be reduced. You are going to have multiple uh, GA like even the uh, irritable bowel uh, disorder. You are going to have the gut flora going to be modulated. And, and through our studies what we have found out that if we give a modulator that is a colon targeted modulator it is restoring the gut flora, automatically things are not going to be aggravated and it is going to be giving you a long term uh, beneficial aspect. So the, uh, this is uh, the all the uh, collaborators what we have and I would like to uh, thank all the organizers, all the speakers who have made my job easier because uh, now we have a gut uh, system of the GA tract which is uh, 
a long system starting from the small intestine to the colon and this can be modeled even for the chemotherapy community right now we are giving the oral target. Instead of giving it orally, you can have a specifically colon targeted delivery can be there and through that it is going to be altering in your uh, the liver function or in even the, for the pancreatic cancers also it can be targeted. So with this I would like to end my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you Dr. Uh, uh, for the nice talk uh, in cancer uh, liver cancer research. So any question from audience? Just a one question actually we are running with that. Okay, thank you sir. Thank you. Thank you so much sir for your great view have you shared by your speech. Can I have a round of applause for the chairman thank you. Man. So we are now moving for the next speaker. She is Dr. Swapna Chaudhary who is going to speak about molecular mechanism.
Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks to the organizers for having me here. Um, so we are all focusing on cancer, and uh, as we know, cancer is a progressive disease, goes from a benign form to a more malignant form. And uh, till date, we know that uh, the two major caveats of cancer are detection and cure. So if detected early, we know cancer still has a very good uh, patient prognosis. Uh, treatment strategies we know include.
include uh, surgery, surgery, radiation, and chemo, or a combination of one or more. And uh, a good follow-up might actually reasonably increase the uh, patient lifestyle. But one of the major problems that I think all of us are facing with regard to cancer is relapse. And that is when cancer actually becomes incurable. Because once the disease relapses, which is often not at the site of its origin, sometimes at a site which is distant, then it really becomes difficult to cure cancer because uh, most often it takes time to find out where the cells have come from, what kind of cells are these, and, and then you need to find out how to treat. So relapse actually is a huge problem. And uh, while uh, uh, getting back into or while investigating into why relapse occurs, uh, people have actually done a lot of studies in leukemia initially and then into solid tumors. And they have actually seen that uh, there are a certain type of cells which are left behind after each chemotherapy. So whether there is a, a radiation or chemo or whatever is given and most of the bulk tumor cells die, there are still some cells left behind and such cells Okay. So, if you are administering a can in a tumor, you administer a conventional chemotherapy and kill these bulk tumor cells, but there will be these uh, green cells which are left behind, and these are enough to set or uh, you know bring back another tumor. And these cells very classically have been called a tumor initiating cell or a cancer stem cell. So what our interest was to target these cells, because we found out that these bulk tumor cells, which are normally uh, dividing cells, would eventually die because each cell has a matrix limit and these cells would eventually die. But uh, if we can target these cells, then the tumor regresses and there are less chances of the tumor coming back or a case of relapse. And these uh, cancer stem cells have certain properties which are very different from any other uh, tumor cells, they're extremely quiescent. So whenever a drug or a radiation is given, they kind of sit tight. They are unaffected by those drugs. They are pluripotent, so that means they can kind of uh, regrow themselves. They have a very high capacity of DNA repair. Uh, and they're very interestingly, they have these ABC transporters, and I think uh, uh, I'm sorry I missed your name, but this gentleman who came from uh, Hong Kong, he mentioned these uh, inhibitors of peat glycoproteins, which are also one of these families, where these are actually pumps sitting on the cells, and what they do, they can peat flux out any drug which is entering the cell. So eventually when you give a drug, these cells will just, these uh, pumps will pump them out, and the drug becomes ineffective. So these cells just survive in that environment. And uh, definitely lead to cancer recurrence. So what I'm going to focus today is to see how uh, we can actually increase the chemosensitivity of those breast cancer stem cells by modulating some of these stemless uh, promoters. So the first thing we did was to isolate the cancer stem cells because we first needed to understand what they are, how they behave before we could do anything with them. So we isolated these cells by two different methods. One is an immunological method using CD markers. The other is an hydrochloric acid, which actually uh, uh, kind of uh, takes uh, advantage of the fact that uh, these cancer stem cells express a lot of aldehyde dehydrogen delays in them. So either by cancer immunophenotyping, where we used uh, breast cancer stem cells, because this whole study focuses on triple negative breast cancers, samples which we got from the Taku Pokor uh, Cancer Institute. And when we immunophenotype them with CD24 and CD44, which are extremely good markers for breast cancer stem cells, we find a population of cells which are actually very high for uh, CD44 uh, and low for CD24. And uh, people have actually denoted them as mutated cancer stem cells. But we really needed to know, are these cancer stem cells? So we did also did an aldefloor assay where we used aldehyde uh, dehydrogenase as the enzyme, added a substrate, got a color, 
and we assayed the fluorescence which was emitted. And this could act, the, this whole reaction could be inhibited by an inhibitor which is known as DAB, that is just a control for the experiment. So from both these experiments, we found that uh, if you, this is a normal tissue, when you look at the population of uh, uh, stem cells, which is just 0.4 percent, but if you look at the tumor tissue, again isolated, the stem cells isolated by the aquifer assay, we find that there is an increase in the number of stem cell populations. And uh, very interestingly, what actually caught our attention was if you take a patient who has already undergone chemotherapy and they still have some residual tumor. And when we analyze those tumor, if you notice that the percentage of those cancer stem cells has actually been enriched. So if you look at the graph down here, I don't know if everyone's been able to see this. This is the normal uh, cancer, uh, stem cell population. This is the stem cell population in a patient who has, is a, who has a naive tumor, has not undergone any chemotherapy, and just look at this huge increase in the cancer stem cell population. So actually what you're doing is when you're giving them chemotherapy, you're actually uh, enriching these cells which have all the potential to give back another tumor once your chemotherapy regime is over. So this really caught our attention. And just to find out are these really cancer stem cells, we analyzed different uh, stem nest markers like OP4, SOX2, nanogrid. Uh, we also found that the telomerase H3 unit is uh, highly expressed in the CSC population or the cancer stem cell population. And we also found ABCG2, which is a very good marker for chemo resistance, is also upregulated in the aldehyde uh, high population. So, Definitely these cells are different from the bulk tumor cells. And uh, another characteristic of these cells are when you grow them, when you normally grow cancer cells, whoever are working with cancer cells know you can grow them in a 2D culture. So they grow uh, as a 2D, uh, uh, in a 2D substratum. But when you ca uh, culture these cancer stem cells, because they are kind of phys uh, physically different, they tend to form spheres. So this is a very interesting assay for these stem cells where you can see that these, uh, pri these are primary mammospheres uh, which are formed from human tumors. So with increasing number of days, you find more and more spheres. And then what we did, we took these day 12 spheres, we uh, dis uh, dissociated the cells and we replated them. And we found when we replated these again, you know, got back into forming spheres. So these sphere formation is actually a good uh, proof that these can undergo self-renewal and they are physically or characteristically different. So definitely these were cancer stem cells that we were working with. So now we wanted to see whether these cancer stem cells, what kind of genes were they expressing? What, how were they so different from the bulk tumor cells? And uh, accordingly, I'm just going to skip this part because this is, uh, we, uh, we uh, simulated the entire effect of a chemo-treated patient with a non-chemo-treated patient in in vitro studies. And we used a drug which is known as paclitaxel, very commonly used as a, a chemotherapeutic agent for treating breast cancer. And we treated uh, triple negative cells with paclitaxel to see what was happening. And we found that paclitaxel actually led to a G2M arrest, a cell cycle arrest, at the G2M phase. And uh, interestingly, when we analyzed those cells which were left behind, we found that the cells which were treated with paclitaxel, in, uh, they expressed more of these pluripotency markers. So in a way where paclitaxel is supposedly killing the tumor or they're arresting the tumor cells and killing them, they are actually again enriching the tumor uh, or the cancer stem cell population, which simulates a chemotherapy, a patient who has undergone chemotherapy. So uh, when we treated these cells with paclitaxel, we found a GPM arrest. When we treated the mammospheres, like I showed these spheres which were formed. So instead of treating all the cells together, we uh, isolated cells, we formed mammospheres, and we treated them with paclitaxel. 
we found that battery capsule actually did not affect the cancer cells of population so much. So it is a drug which is efficient in killing bulk tumor cells, but they do not affect the cancer stem cells. So the cancer stem cells which are left behind, again, as we saw, can give back to a, a tumor. So uh, these are just some of the experiments which show that when you treat cells with battery capsule, there, there is an increase in the uh, cancer stem cell population. This is the manospheres, which where you see the number of uh, uh, cancer stem cells increasing. And this is a, a image in uh, by scanning electron microscopy where you look at the control uh, manospheres, whereas the fatty capsule manospheres can actually kind of uh, degrade these cells, but they're not actually getting rid of the cells, they're still persisting. So now we really wanted to see what was happening at the molecular level. So we did a microarray analysis with the normal stem cells and the cancer stem cells, and we uh, looked at genes which belong to different cohorts like uh, uh, cancer stem cell markers related to proliferation, cell renewal, pluripotency, asymmetric division, migration, metastasis, loss of stemness, signal transduction, and therapeutic targets. And uh, we, this is a heat map of the uh, differential gene expression that we found, and we did notice that there were genes which were being up and down regulated. So, while looking through the, or while doing some data mining, we found there was one particular gene which really caught our interest, and that was SOX2. Earlier, I mentioned SOX2 is a very potent, uh, a very uh, good stemless marker, and we found that SOX2 is being upregulated more than the other stemless markers, and uh, along with ABCG2, which is your chemoresistance marker. To see if this is actually the case, what we did, we uh, isolated uh, cells, uh, a normal and the cancer stem cells from tumors, from human tumors, and we found that SOX2 is highly upregulated with ABCG2. When we uh, cultured uh, the, man uh, I mean the stem cells, we again find an immensely high expression of SOX2 with ABCG2. The same thing was simulated in uh, cell lines, which is the MDA 231 cells, and in each and every case we find a very high expression of SOX2. So we wanted to really find out what is SOX2 so special about, and how is it actually related to ABCG2, or whether pluripotency stemness is somehow very intricately connected to chemo resistance. So SOX2 basically is a transcription factor which is very important for early development and uh, linked with cellless or in uh, different solid tumors. So, and we have definitely seen that SOX2 is very highly expressed in the spheres that we were forming. So we wanted to see that what would happen if we got rid of SOX2. So we silenced SOX2 in the cell lines and in the uh, manospheres that we formed just to see how exactly was SOX2 affecting the other genes. And very surprisingly, when we knock down SOX2, uh, it not only downregulates itself, it downregulates the other stemless markers, and very interestingly, also downregulates the chemoresistance marker, which is, which is ABCG2. And the similar uh, assays were done, even if you treat it with paclitaxel, even paclitaxel, which we found could kill the uh, bulk tumor cells, were actually when you uh, uh, treat it uh, or when you administer it after downregulating SOX2, were able to downregulate, which normally could not downregulate SOX2 or ABCG2, could do it when SOX2 was obliterated. So definitely there was a big connection between SOX2 and chemo resistance. And if you look at the formation of uh, spheres which were forming very well in the control uh, phase were actually not being able to form really, or actually not being able to self-renew themselves. So next we wanted to see whether there was, it was really linked to chemo resistance. And what we found that when by MT, we did an MTT assay and we found that pathotaxel treatment actually could reduce cell viability but only at a dose of almost 7 nanomolar. But when we, do, when we uh, knocked down SOX2, where if you look at the strangle sequence where uh, pathotaxel was only uh, 
uh, effective at 7 nanomolar, when we knocked down SOX2, the cells were actually more uh, receptive to that fashion of paclitaxel and was more effective at 3 nanomolar. So cells which were losing their SOX2 were actually becoming more chemosensitive. And that was a big finding for us because we could actually use something or use a method by which we were making these uh, cells which were impervious to the effects of a chemotherapy or a chemo drug and they were now becoming more sensitive. So we now wanted to find out whether there is some other way by which we can downregulate SOX2 or we can somehow make these cells more receptive to anti-cancer drugs. So we know, I mean a lot of studies has been done where we know that drug-loaded nanoparticles could be more efficient in, in uh, making a drug more uh, sensitive and uh, making these cells more receptive towards the drug. So that is where we then switched our gears and we synthesized certain polymeric nanoparticles which, uh, which uh, uh, using PLGA which had efficient biodegradability, enhanced biocompatibility and a low antigenicity and we used a drug called retinolactone which we wanted to see which is a kind of a known anti-cancer drug. We wanted to see if where once they were encapsulated whether they would perform better. And uh, these were some of the characterizations which were done. We found that uh, this drug was being taken up by the cells very efficiently by almost uh, within two hours and was very effective at pH 5 which is usually the pH inside of the gut. And uh, when we administered, uh, when we looked at cell viability, we found that uh, vedulolactone by itself was not that effective. You, you can see the dose at 80 uh, microgram per ml, whereas once it was encapsulated, it was effective at 20. So you can see the humongous efficiency which the drug underwent once it was encapsulated. And uh, uh, just as I showed the previous uh, chemosensitivity assay, the same thing was repeated when the drug was encapsulated, the efficiency or the uh, efficacy went down and almost done. From 80 to 20, so it was making the drug more efficient. The ABC G2, which were the inhibitors of uh, drug, or rather the promoters of drug, is flux, I'm almost done, almost done. Uh, so they were being down okay, yeah, yeah, so I like to mix. Yeah, so I, I don't know, oh. I'm, I'm just done. And I just wanted to show this paper that we actually tried it in, in vivo study. So you can see the huge tumor which is there, which when treated with the drug itself was reduced, but when you treated with the more encapsulated drug, it was further reduced, and the stem cell population was also coming down. So, I, now I just want to thank the Peter Mukherjee who is here already, who has actually worked on the uh, chemoresistance and pluripotency and Srimanthi, a postdoc in the lab, did the nanoparticle study. These are my collaborators, uh, Dr. Amir Gupta, who provided samples and DVT. So, thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for your nice talk on uh, stem cell of uh, uh, our best cancer. Uh, those who are involved in uh, cancer research in Bangor, uh, Madam Janaji, one of them. So, any question from the audience? If you see, if you give a holiday of this treatment, if you make on and off treatment, whether you can control the emergence of stem cell, stem cells. Absolutely, because that is what is uh, something which is done when you are actually making these drug resistant cell lines, where you keep giving on and off or you keep reducing the dose of treatment and you actually keep increasing the stem cell population. So each and every time those cells are getting enriched. Yes. Yeah. Right, so that's only when you're not uh, getting rid of your SOX2. So if, if you can efficiently get rid of the SOX2, then it becomes more sensitive. That's where you are. Yes. Okay.